The following presentation was recorded at the 2012 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond sponsors in 2012 for helping make these videos possible. Okay, so I think our sound level is back and we're not as echoey and we should be good. Okay, so just before break we started talking about sharing and I gave some examples on why you don't mix and match um, multiple types of shares on the same volume or data set. You're fine to create different types of shares, just don't do it on the same piece of storage. Either uh, do a share per data set or a share per volume. We'll take a quick look at what sort of decision making goes behind deciding what type of share is going to be best for your environment. And it's really going to depend upon mostly what clients you're running. And the secondary uh, decision will be um, what sort of network performance am I going to need to support. So if you are in an all Mac environment, an Apple share is obviously a no-brainer. That's the type that you're going to want to set up. It's going to have all of the features in the share that your Mac clients are going to um, need to support. And one of the things we get in the Apple shares, uh, let's just see if it's in this screen. I don't think it is. I think it's in the other screen. So you can do all kinds of stuff. So if you've ever set up Netatalk by hand, Netatalk is the back end. So basically all the configura configuration options are in there. And there's quite a few things that you can do. You can set up your initial permissions. And there's a bunch of, I'm going to just take a look at advanced mode. Basically every single Netatalk option that's out there, um, you can decide to check that on your share. Now, most people haven't set up Netatalk by hand, so if you go to doc.freenas.org in the Apple Talk section, we have nice tables that describes um, every single field uh, when you would choose that if it's going to be a good fit for your network, so what that option actually does for you. One of the things that we can do with Apple Talk, and this will actually be in our AFP service, let's go down here. Uh, nope, I missed it. It was up here. Where is our... Oh, there's this one. Oh, there we are. It does support Time Machine. So if you're using Time Machine for backups, you just basically select that, and it's a very quick way of doing it. For a while there, um, when the latest um, Mac came out last July, it was broken for a while, Time Machine, in the newest Lion, and that was because Apple hadn't released that code, so the Netatalk people couldn't put in the support. There was a huge uproar, and within two weeks they released it, and it was a Netatalk, and then it was in FreeNAS. So yes, you, it does support Lion as well. Yes? Uh, can you just set, uh, size for yes. Yes. So one of the things, especially for those of you that came in um, uh, this afternoon and you missed the ZFS stuff, because I guess they promised that the ZFS stuff was in the afternoon instead of first thing in the morning. Um, one of the cool things about ZFS is you can create things called data sets. So when you create ZFS, you feed it your disks, and that's known as your storage pool. A data set, when you create it, and I'll just show that screen, once you have a ZFS pool, Or actually, let's just do it this way. Let's create a ZFS data set. Um, typically, one of the reasons we're creating data sets is we actually want to portion off a partition of our ZFS volume. So you will create a quota where you basically set the size limit. If you're dealing with Time Machine, uh, one of the things that I discovered when I was um, documenting it is if you have a Mac system that's fresh installed with no data, it takes up 21 gigs of space uh, to do your Time Machine backup. So you're going to want to make sure when you're creating a data set to do Time Machine backups that you have a good amount of space because Time Machine by default is going to do a full backup, then your dailies and your weeklies and your monthlies. 
and you want to make sure you have enough space um, on your data set to do that because Time Machine by default will start erasing things when it runs out of space. So you'll want to make sure you have enough to hold for your backup schedule. Does that answer your question? Uh, so it does support Time Machine, and it just sort of works like magic. You just pick Time Machine from that drop-down menu, assuming your Apple Talk Share is set up and the user can access the system. Your FreeNAS system will just show as a backup device when they go to make their Time Machine backup. Yes? Well, can you configure it to automatically delete one of the older backups? In other words, like I want to do a backup every day, but I want to delete after three days? That I don't know because I'm not a Mac user. I assume that would be on the time machine end, on the client end. Does anybody know the answer to that one? No. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I always forget. It started out as Unix, and they took out all the, the fun Unix stuff. Okay. So that's Apple. Now, again, I'm not a Mac person. Um, and I know that there are settings in the... Um, Apple Talk setting to support non-Mac clients. In the real world, I don't know how that works. I don't know if you need additional software on a non-Mac machine to do that. So if anybody knows the answer to that one, let me know. Yes, thank you. Now, the, I know the initial one is a full. Is everything after that an incremental? Yes. Okay. But usually you want to do at least two times the volume size of the internal drive in the system. Okay. So if I don't get it, I'm going to do a terabyte. Okay. That'll give you at least a year or two of the practice running in I will not remember that, and that's a really good advice. Can you email me that suggestion? I'll make sure it gets in the docs. Okay. So that, that's an Apple share. Typically, if you are in a hybrid environment where you have a mix of clients, you're going to choose either um, NFS or SIFs. And you'll usually um, go more towards the SIF size if most of your clients are Windows. And if you have Active Directory running, uh, SIFs will definitely make sure that, that you get the most out of your Windows systems. There's a couple of problems um, with SIFs, though, and most of it deals with the design of Samba, and Samba per connection is single-threaded. So you'll find that if you have a lot of uh, Windows users over the network, it's going to perform slower than other types of shares. And there's not much that we can do about that because that's just part of the design of Samba. If you find that you really need to support SIFS shares, if you read um, that section of the documentation, we have a troubleshooting section that refers you to the various um, uh, smb.com variables that you can play with to try to tune to get the most out of your network. The other thing that you have to be aware of is um, SIFS can be CPU bound. So if your CPU is not the greatest, your SIFS performance is going to suck. So one of the best things that you can do is to get more CPU power, which will increase performance. Um, yes? One thing that I've done in the past to increase performance to Windows clients, mm -hmm. actually doing an ISO's mount out of FreeNAS yep. into a Windows box and then present um, the Windows shares from the Windows box to the Windows client. Yep. So that way they can see the performance. Yeah, exactly. Now, the, if you're going to be doing that, again, ZFS is the greatest because you can make your ZVols, and that way each user can have their own ZVol, so basically their own storage area. Okay. Now, NFS is problematic as well. So with SIFs, you get all kinds of permissions and the way that you can set up authentication. There's all kinds of things you can do. NFS, basically, you can only limit it to IP addresses, network se segments. So you're not going to get the authentication that you get with SIFs. 
The other thing that will be problematic if you have Windows users, if they're running a home edition rather than an enterprise edition, there is no built-in NFS client, which means you're installing third-party software if you're going to be using NFS. NFS, though, will outperform um, SIFs in most cases, and sometimes that's what you need to choose, especially if you're in a mixed environment. So you have Linux systems and Windows systems. Yes? NFS, but then authentication is basically doesn't exist. So if authentication and Windows ACLs and extended attributes and all that stuff is important to you, um, you're you're more on the SIF size. Okay. Yep. In my case, it's just going to be like my family accessing files. Yep. Um, is that going to be? I mean, I would use NFS, but I'm on Linux. Right. So then they would have no problems like getting files, reading and Correct. Yeah, and it's very quick and dirty. So basically put in the network address for your family subnet, and then they can get in. Okay. Yeah, and if they're comfortable, um, if you're comfortable mounting things for them and they're comfortable accessing it, that's one way to go. Would it be a problem in the writing format? Because, like, for example, on my movies, I would lock those from them, but I would, have, I would want access to write to them so I can either, you know, put more movies on them. Right. Yeah. So when you're setting up your initial permissions on that volume, you would be the user and group that basically owns that share. Yeah. And then you would set the initial permissions. Okay. And also, while you're on NFS, you can also divide up um, your file system basically into your mounts. So you could create separate mounts for things as well if there were certain mounts you didn't want people to have access to. Again, if you're using ZFS, which you won't be because you don't have the, the memory, probably not, I would use data sets, and then I would have a mount per data set. Oh, okay. Yeah. So UFS, you have to plan a bit, a bit more. Okay. Okay. Uh, you had a question? Now that's a good question. I think you can just go in and change it because it's basically setting the maximum space and I don't think it hurts the volume or the data set to go in and change it, but honestly I haven't tried. But I think I'm pretty sure it allows you to do that. Has anybody tried that before? I'm assuming if you decrease it's only going to decrease down to what you're actually using for space. Yeah. No, I don't think it is, because basically a data set, you know, unless you limit it, has access to the entire pool. So I would assume if the pool still had the space available for the size you're setting on the data set, I, I, I don't think that would be a problem. Okay. Uh, any other questions before we leave the shares? So the full details, again, it's on the PDF. I've given the URLs to the sections in the guide, uh, in the documentation. Because if you are setting it up, you'll want to, there's going to be a lot of fields in each type of share. So you'll want to um, read through the table that describes what each field does and decide whether or not that's a good fit uh, for what it is that you're trying to do. The other thing that each um, configuration chapter for the shares is it will give examples. So it will give examples to allow anonymous access um, for um, Apple or SIFs. Uh, it'll give examples to require the user to authenticate first. And we also, in the Windows one, um, shadow copies are support. So it also shows you how to set up shadow copies. Has, is everybody familiar with what the term shadow copies is or what you can do with that? Okay. So basically, it'll only work on ZFS 
and you have to um, create snapshot tasks, which, which we'll talk about. Um, but basically, as files are modified, it keeps a revision of uh, all of the files. And it'll show up in Explorer, and you can go back to a previous revision of a file. So that support is built in. OK, so in our configuration workflow, that was step four. So you're going to decide what type of sharing that you want to do and set up that type of share. Now, you're not limited to those three, uh, especially if you're, say, in a home environment or if you're in a um, Unix geeky environment where people are used to um, accessing data in different ways. Sometimes, uh, especially if it's on an internal network, you just have a couple of users. Maybe they're not that um, uh, technically oriented but they're comfortable opening up a browser or some sort of FTP client and accessing data through FTP. FTP, um, you can set it up to either be anonymous, where they can just get in through their client and access the data, or you can set it up um, to go over an encrypted connection. You can also set it up that users are limited to their own files. So basically, it sets up a CH root. Uh, that is um, something you can configure as well. Um, so if you decide that's actually the easiest way, because one of the nice things about FTP is it doesn't matter what OS you're on. As long as you have an FTP client, you can get at the data. So this can be a quick and dirty way, say, especially in a, in a, a small network environment. So setting up anonymous FTP is as easy as pick, um, picking the anonymous box. And you can do things like allow uh, uh, file transfer resumption. Uh, it will work through a NAT device um, if you uh, need to do that. And turning on encryption is as easy as uh, checking off the box for that. So FTP is fairly uh, quick and dirty for setting up. Uh, the other thing that you can do, and I find this is handy, especially if I need to get data onto a system quickly, uh, just to get the user started, you can configure SSH. Uh, if you decide this is the way you're going to share your data, uh, typically your users have to have a little bit more uh, networking clue, um, or you train them how to use uh, something like PuTTY or WinSCP so that they can have a GUI to get at the files. One of the things you'll find with SSH, uh, in order for it to work, um, uh, the user account has to exist, and you can um, set the volume or data set that will be their home directory. It does support um, setting up um, SSH key-based authentication. So you just basically uh, paste in the key there, and it will do everything it needs to do to make sure that works. And one of the things I usually do if I'm setting up SSH is I create an SSH CH root environment. So by default, they can still see what's above their home directory. If you set up a CH root, uh, they're limited to the contents of their home directory, and they can't see above it. And there is directions in the documentation how to set that up. Right now, it's not a checkbox. There's a couple of sshd underscore config options you have to type in manually. And you also have to manually create the home directories. And that's just a limitation of how sshch root works. So that's another option. And I'll also do a quick overview of iSCSI, because uh, a lot of environments iSCSI is appropriate. And if you have never used iSCSI before, you're definitely going to want to take a look at this chapter in our documentation, because we start off uh, just with the basic terminology. So iSCSI has its own terminology associated with what it does. You'll notice there's a lot of um, options in the tree here. And we've basically set it up in the order that you configure your FreeNAS system to um, um, make your iSCSI target. And some of these are optional. So two of them you don't have to do. So an authorized access, you only need if you need authentication. 
So when you're dealing with iSCSI, the client system is known as the initiator and your storage device is the target. If you require um, the initiator to actually authorize before accessing the data, you make an authorized access. And your choices are to configure CHAP or to configure mutual CHAP. So there's two for those. The other thing that is optional that you don't have to do, it depends upon your system, is something called a portal. If you only have one interface that's available as for the iSCSI target, you don't make a portal because it requires multiple interfaces. And this is something we were talking about on the break. You can do um, NIC bonding with LACP, but that is not efficient over iSCSI. It's actually more efficient to go in and create a portal. And when you create a portal, you specify um, the IP address that you basically want to bond together. So if I have a system with multiple NICs and they have the multiple IP addresses set, I can select two or three of those and basically bond those together. Some of the cool things I can do once I have a portal is I can decide which initiators are allowed to attach to which portals. So you can, yes. Yes, yeah, this is how you do it if you're using ESXi. Yeah, you create a portal. So don't use um, LACP for that. So those two are optional. The rest basically is the order that you do it in. Uh, so those that were here earlier, we talked a little bit of dip about the difference between device extents and file extents. The only time you should use a file extent is if you're using UFS. UFS doesn't allow you to divide up your volume like uh, we can with ZFS and data sets. Um, so in a file extent, you're basically saying, I want you to take this much of the file system. So basically, you put in an extent size. This is the only way to do it with UFS, and it's not as recommended because it's slower than using a device extent iSCSI, what you really want to do is to emulate a raw disk device, which you do with a device extent. And the only way to get a device extent is to create a ZVOL. And basically, when you create your ZVOL, you give it the amount of space. And that's something we do with ZFS. So if you're using ZFS, make a device extent. If you're using UFS, make a file extent. And regardless of the type of extent you make, basically you're setting aside the amount of space that will be available to the initiator. Oops. Once you've made an extent, you then go in and say which initiator are allowed to connect to your FreeNAS system. So any clients that are going to come in through iSCSI have to be running initiator software and you can go in and specify either particular host IP addresses, a subnet, or a network. Or if you will accept connections from anyone, you can use the uh, keyword all. So you can specify which systems are allowed to come in using iSCSI. The portal is optional. I'm just going to ignore the global config for a minute. You then create the target, and in the target, you're basically um, defining um, basically what would be considered the share. So with iSCSI, uh, they have really weird names that start with IQN. So uh, we have a link to where you can go and figure out how to put in the proper name. And you can, if you're using portals, you can say which portals you're going to use. And if you have set up um, auth authentication, you can specify the authentication. So none of these are set up yet, so it doesn't look like much. And then the last thing you do is you take a target that you made and you map it to an extent. And in iSCSI, because you're emulating a raw disk device, you should only map in a one-to-one -one manner. So you should map one target to one extent. 
So if you have multiple initiators, you should make a target extent mapping for each initiator. So they basically get their own emulated disk. Correct. Well, not really, because it's the extent that defines, you don't have to really share anything at that point. Correct, but that's different than iSCSI. So, so explain that more fully. And is the sharing something that's done on the VMware side? No, it's done on the storage side. And what, how do you, what, so, so I think it's a terminology thing, so how are you sharing it? <laughs> okay, uh, uh, um, um, with like SANS, you, you would have one volume and you would you know, connect multiple clients to the same volume of data so that all of them can see the data that is written to that one volume in the same. But is that volume just another name for an extent? Yeah, because I think that's what it is. I think it's an extent. But they may be using the term volume just to make it more confusing. <laughs> yes. The other thing, and it really depends upon the initiator software that you're using, and this is where you sometimes have to refer to the documentation for the client system. If you go into target global configuration, there are um, about 40 fields, all of which look like Greek, so you're gonna wanna read the table to see what each one does. This is where you fine tune the performance between the target and the client. So some initiator software uh, works better if you change the default settings. And typically it will um, be in the documentation for your initiator, they'll tell you to bump up your no pin interval or whatever field that it is, and they'll tell you what to put in there. So what we tell people is don't touch this unless you've read something that said for better performance, bump up this value. Uh, we do have um, an example in the documentation for um, a um, initiator running in Zen because it needs four um, variables that are changed. So basically, don't go in here unless something told you to change a value. So those are your iSCSIs. And those are basically your choices for sharing. So you either have AFP, NFS, or SIFs. You can set up a quick and dirty FTP. You can use SSH, or you can use iSCSI. Uh, any questions before we leave that section? So I see lunch is starting to kick in. It's getting harder to, harder to keep up. So let's say you've created your volumes, you have your users, you have your permissions set, you've decided upon what sort of sharing mechanism you're gonna do, you've gone in and you've made your shares. Nothing happens until you turn on the applicable services. So once all of those are set up, you go down to services, and the service you turn on depends upon what it is that you've configured. So obviously, if you've gone and made AFP shares, you're gonna to wanna to turn on your AFP service. If you've made SIFs, you're gonna turn on SIFs, FTP, and so on. You may have to turn on more than one service, depending upon what you're doing. So if you have configured SIF shares in an Active Directory network, you're also gonna to have to turn on the Active Directory service. So it really depends on what you're doing. Before you turn on AFP, make your AFP shares. Before you turn on Active Directory, you need to configure it first. It needs to know the name of your PDC. It needs to know the name of your realm. So if I just turn on the Active Directory service, my little console um, log menu is gonna say that it failed. It'll probably say something like can't find domain controller. If you turn on something like Active Directory and get an error, 
you're going to want to take a closer look at um, the information that you put in here. And if that still fails, you're going to want to refer to that section in the documentation because we do have troubleshooting. Especially in Active Directory, we'll find that there's two reasons why it doesn't start. Uh, one is there is a time problem on the network, so your time is not in sync. And the other problem uh, deals with DNS SRV records. So you can go in and configure Active Directory the way you want, but if there's something in DNS overriding it, that's what's going to happen. So if it's not finding your realm, first thing you should check is your DNS records. And we have lots of links in the documentation saying, how do I check it? What am I looking for? What should I be changing it to? Uh, yep. Yeah, so the comment was when you're doing your Active Directory. Now let's find our wrench here. So your domain name will be lowercase and your net BIOS name will be uppercase. Yeah, and it's very picky about that. And I don't know, so we do have tool tips and this is something we can always use feedback on. Yeah, so that one's lowercase. Uh, work group name, that one's uppercase. So often, especially if you're doing a tool tip and you'll find that it's either if you find it misleading or you think a couple of more words would have made that tool tip more useful, that's something that you can put in as a uh, feature request uh, using track. Or if you're um, more anxious than that, uh, you can hop on IRC and suggest that and see if somebody just does it. And if they don't just do it, then you go to track. Whenever you're starting a service, uh, this was the reason, and I know in this lighting it's really hard to see, this is the reason why you have your web console going, and you should be watching those messages go by. One thing I didn't show you in the web console, and it'll probably still look like crap, is if you can't read that much, you just click on it and it brings it full, uh, full up. And again, with the lighting, you can't really see. But the nice thing is, is you can copy and paste so if you're submitting a support ticket, you can actually show what your log messages are. And you can also uh, scroll up uh, to see what happened in your logs. And you can just press X to close that. It'll still be down there. Uh, so that's rather handy. If your service successfully started, uh, your last step, no, nope, second last step is to test the configuration. So if you've gone and created SIF shares, get yourself on a Windows client. Um, if you're requiring authentication, make sure the user authenticated and make sure the user is seeing the share that they're supposed to be seeing. Um, same for any other sort of service. So hop on a client and make sure what you hope is happening is actually what's happening. Once you've tested your configuration, you're going to want to back up the configuration. So what I always tell people, the OS itself doesn't matter. Doesn't matter if the OS dies. Uh, doesn't matter if somebody takes out the thumb drive and stomps on it. The OS is trivial. It doesn't matter. What you care about is the data on your storage disks, which is why you set up redundancy and you do backups. What you care about is your configuration which is why you back up your configuration. If the OS goes, you download the latest image, you throw it on a USB stick, you stick it in, the system perks along. So it's the config that you care about, not the OS. So we get questions all the time. People say, how do I back up my OS? And I tell them, don't. If your OS goes, download the image, stick it on the stick, throw it in the box. So it's your config that you care about. So to back up the config, we go back up to our system. Settings, advanced, and you want to, uh, no, I'm in the wrong place. It's under general. You want to save config. 
It will give it a name that gives you an idea of what your revision and OS is. It'll put a date stamp on it, and it's basically backing up your database. You're doing this from your system, which means it's an off-site backup. So every time you make a configuration change, just go in there, it takes all of five seconds, save it, and it's gonna be timestamped for you so you know what your config is. Yep. Can I back up? Yes. We don't put that in the documentation because we don't um, encourage people to make changes from the CLI. But if you go into the forms, you'll definitely see how to do that. Because um, you're basically mucking about with a MySQL database. But it can be done. Yep. It can also be backed up, um, but we want people to use the GUI. And so that upload config uh, is if you ever want to restore either a previous config or you've done an update that went terribly wrong and you've, you've lost your config, you just go in and you upload one of your saved configs. Say that again. Yeah, deleting volumes, yes, that will affect the data. <laughs> no. As long as you don't destroy your volumes, your data is safe. Now, the other thing you could consider as being bad to do is to ignore alerts, uh, your smart tests, uh, never read your emails. So to let disks die, uh, that would be a bad thing. But other than that, so this, again, this is one of the reasons why it was designed. The OS is separate from your data, is separate from your config. Okay. And always, uh, before you do an upgrade, I'll take that last minute and save your config. Now that we have a volume, I can actually show an upgrade. Um, so while we're in here, I'll do an advanced. So a firmware update. So when you're going to do an upgrade, you just download the file that says upgrade, and it will have a version uh, higher than the one that you have. What we recommend to people is to always upgrade from release to release. What we tell people not to do is because we do have beta versions, and we also have nightly builds that have the latest features, don't put a nightly on a production box and then downgrade down to a release. That's when you're going to be doing things like figuring out how to do your backup configuration manually into the database and to clean out the database stuff. So that's why we end up helping people on IRC who do that sort of thing. But if you upgrade from a release to a release, you should not have a problem because these are always tested before we um, put a release out to make sure that the upgrades work. Obviously, um, we're assuming that if you're upgrading, you already have an existing system, so you have volumes you can temporarily save your firmware file to. Then it's a simple matter of browsing to that file that you downloaded. It's going to have an SHA-256 checksum which will be in the release notes. So you can copy and paste it there. Or if, God forbid, you didn't read the release notes before doing an upgrade, you can just run an SSH-256 and grab it. But it requires both of those. You click Apply Update. It does it. It reboots the system. You're now running the new operating system. If things go badly, you reboot again, and you pick your original operating system you hop on the IRC and you ask what went wrong. Yep. Uh, I don't necessarily have a system that uh, PFSense uses where you don't have to download a file and then turn it download it, it will download itself. Yep. Yeah. So uh, he mentioned that PFSense um, will actually detect that there's a new update and will do it for you. We used to have an extra button here um, that we were thinking we would do that and it hadn't been implemented up, implemented up to 8.2, so they took it out. So at some point, they may put it back in. 
Uh, but for now, I think it's really because we want people to read release notes uh, that we force them to go and download it and read the release notes. Yep. You probably already said this, and I might have missed it, but can you revert? Can you go back? Yes. Yes. Any consequences there? Um, no. Shares? No. Because it hasn't touched your data. Um, the old version will still have the configuration database, which doesn't matter because you already have a backup of it. So you just revert back to the old OS. I mean, that's with an eight, or you couldn't go back to seven. Correct. So um, while we're talking about seven, one of the things you have to always be careful of is your ZFS version. So when FreeNAS 8 came out, it was on ZFS version 15. At that point in time, the old FreeNAS 7 series was on ZFS version 13. If you ever go from a lower ZFS version to a higher, that's a one-time deal. So it'll successfully upgrade to the new version, but you can't go back. So you can't downgrade your ZFS version. The FreeNAS 7 series has been end of life, so it doesn't exist anymore. It's been rebranded as NAS for free, and they're right now on ZFS 28, which means you can't go from a NAS for free to a um, FreeNAS 8, because you'd be downgrading from version 28 to version 15, and that just doesn't work. You will destroy your data if you attempt it. So always make sure when you're upgrading that you know the underlying ZFS version if you're going between different um, um, operating systems. Because you, you can only bump up ZFS, you can't go back down. Okay? Uh, in that save debug, it will tell you. Now, if I'm in shell, see if I can remember my ZFS commands. It's either ZFS pool, which will tell me. Z pool status, thank you. Do I need a switch with it? We may be adding this to the useful command line utilities. <laughs> Yeah, because we don't have man pages and we don't have internet access, so I can't just look up to see what switch I'm missing. Anybody else play with ZFS or ZPool? I thought it was like ZFS version. Um, it will be, no, it's not in the 8.0 series, it's in the 8.2 series. That's when it was introduced. We'll have to come up with that. I might look on break to see if we can figure that out. Z pool status, and it told you? Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. It's not showing for me. Might be because I'm a stripe and not a RAID Z. Okay, so something good to look up. Well, it depends. The latest stable version is 804P2. That's what you run in production. So we are, we are running a, a beta version of what's coming in 8.2. So, okay. so it's, it's fun to play with, but don't put it on your production systems. Okay. okay? I have No. So we have, we have the newest, latest, and greatest. It was actually the nightly as of Tuesday. It should. 
if it understands the underlying hardware, yeah. So it's not like Windows where everything is tied into the hardware. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, FreeBSD really doesn't care. As long as it understands the hardware, it's fine. Yeah. Yep. Yep. How are we doing for time? We got five minutes. Okay. Okay, so I'll just do a quick um, overview of what we did in our config workflow. Yep, we had a question. Z pool. And again, it's very terrible here. Yeah, and it only shows. So it's nice. So it's basically that table. It shows every feature and what it understands, and it stops at 15. So you're running ZFS 15. Good. Okay, so just um, to recap what our configuration um, overflow was, or workflow. So the first step was to go in, see if I can remember my seven steps. Configure your volumes, so tell the system which disks um, it's playing with. Then you'll go in and create your users or groups, or import them from AD or import them from LDAP. You'll then configure the starting permissions. You'll configure sharing after deciding what type is best for your network. You'll start the services associated with that sharing. You'll test your configuration, and then once everything's working, you'll back up your config. Uh, when we come back from the break, uh, we're going to do some managing ZFS. So we're going to take a closer look at snapshots and how to automatically schedule their creation. We'll then talk about replicating those to another system. And uh, we'll talk a bit more about ZFS scrubs and how to schedule those. So what time do we come back from break? 2.45. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies these bugs are getting discovered and, and fixed is a, a thing that really shows the power of the you know of the open source community. It is global, and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 <laughs> people. Uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Is, uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail, and CloudStack is designed to handle number one that mass scale. Number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, 
in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago, uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support, uh, different network models, you can pick up whatever suits you better. Cloudstack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint, it's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using Cloudstack, they were using it to transcode video, and I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up, uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers, and then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. Cloudstack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think Cloudstack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and, and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits to the cloud stack. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and the administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on asterisks. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Asterisk based systems, including our own SwitchFox based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Asterisk or SwitchFox based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Asterisk. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. 
again.